Okay, I'm really pleased to be able to uh, announce to you, to introduce to you uh, Professor Daisy Rooks. Oh, I guess I should first do my usual thing with the please turn off your cell phones and reminding you that these, uh, these lectures are all being taped by MCAT and we'll let you know what the schedule is for televising those on MCAT uh, by the end of the, of the uh, series. So we just have two more after tonight, right? I think so, I think so. Um, our lecturer for tonight is Professor Daisy Rooks from the Sociology Department. Uh, as I did with everybody else, I asked Daisy to tell me something um, about herself that probably most of us didn't know. And I asked her to tell me how she got involved in uh, the business of social justice. Um, she says, I think this is the part she wasn't, I don't think this is the social justice part. Um, in her 20s, she worked for a, a YMCA camp in Massachusetts, leading teen trips. One summer, I led a dozen 13 and 14 year olds, mama mia, you're a saint. Saint Daisy, we'll call her from now on, on a hiking and camping trip in the Czech Republic and Greece. And I live to tell about it. And we're glad you did, Daisy. We're glad you did. The other thing she tells me is that she grew up, um, she went to a Quaker school when she was young, although her family were not practicing Quakers. Uh, but every time she was in the church, she kept hearing that it's the good person's job to do the best he or she can to make the world fair and to make the world just for other people. And uh, she tells me, and she may talk about this a little bit later on, that she's tried to do this in lots of different ways throughout her career, but a lot of her research has recently focused on the kinds of people who are involved in social justice issues, activists and so on and so forth, and where they come from and what their lives are like. And tonight she's going to be talking to us about sort of a new demographic of, of activists. So I'm really, um, I will say to you that te um, Tobin Shearer was announced to be a respondent uh, to Daisy's talk. That was when we were sort of working under a different format. So Tobin isn't here with us tonight, except maybe in spirit. Um, we think he's probably putting his feet up at home. We, not, really, truly not. Okay, so Daisy, um, come and chat with us, and then we'll do the usual question and answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Well, I'm excited to be here tonight and to be part of this lecture series. I appreciate the Alumni Association for inviting me to be part of it. And uh, truth be told, I'm most excited because three years ago, right before I moved to Montana, I bought this suit. <laughs> and I have never worn it. So. Uh, my parents assured me if you buy a suit, you will find an opportunity to wear it in Montana, and they were wrong. So until tonight. So uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm a little bit of a pacer, so if you can hang with me, if it makes you feel uh, seasick, just uh, look at something else. So I'm going to talk tonight about uh, a few different things, and I'm going to draw pretty heavily on some research that I conducted for a book manuscript that I'm working on. Am I picking up both mics? Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, and the research for this book was qualitative in nature. I interviewed, uh, I conducted 120 in-depth interviews with young activists, with experienced activists that train and mentor them, and with staff of two organizations, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, that facilitate what I believe is a new and interesting form of activism. And my main purpose tonight is to try to spark a discussion about the future of social justice by focusing on activism and activists. And so I thought since our previous speakers have been really good about providing us definitions and parameters for the things that they're talking about and not talking about, I thought I would start with a little bit of that and then jump into the topic. So when we think about activism or activists, we often think about a number of different things. When I looked it up in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, they told me that it was a noun. And it was a belief system or practice that emphasizes direct, vigorous action in support of or opposition to one side of a controversial issue. And so tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a new 
a sort of approach to activism that really picked up steam during the 1990s. And I'm going to talk about the United States, and I'm going to talk about progressive activism. But I would love, in the question and answer period at the end, to delve into a broader array of topics if people are interested. Um, talking about activism in international contexts or in different time periods or talk about uh, different uh, activism motivated by different belief uh, systems or political ideology. And so I believe the topic of social justice and activism is really quite timely. Activism has been in the news in, to some extent, an unprecedented uh, way over the past year. So we had all of the media coverage of the Arab Spring last year. And this fall and winter, there's been tremendous coverage of the Occupy movement, which many of the talks in this series have mentioned briefly. So my interest in, in activism especially, and in this new form of activism, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, started in the late 1990s. I was in graduate school, and I was very interested in the study of social change and social movements. And in 1999, I went to a talk by a very well-known sociologist that studies social movements. His name is Doug McAdam. He's at Stanford University. And he wrote, in many ways, what's a seminal text on activism within sociology called Freedom Summer, about the young people in the 1960s that were involved in um, nonviolent direct action in the civil rights movement. And during this time in the 1990s, many of the, the late 90s, many of my cohort in grad school, we were very interested in this question about what the future of activism was. And in particular, these ideas that were emerging in our discipline and also in the media, wondering, is this the end of activism as we know it? And there were two things that really influenced our thinking at that time. The first was the publication of a book in, I, I feel like I'm sort of moving in and out of the mic. Is that? True? No. OK, great. OK. Uh, the publication of a book in 2000 called Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam, who's a Harvard sociologist, who wrote a book about the decline of civic life in the United States. And though the book came out in 2000, he published a seminal article in 1995 where he worked on a lot of the main ideas that he discussed in the book. And the general argument, I'm going to give you sort of a very nutshell, very brief, very unsatisfying <laughs> summary of a long, dense book. And you can correct me in the Q&A that I got it wrong. But his main point in the book was really to investigate the decline of what he calls social capital, which many people refer to as social networks and the sort of reciprocity that they bring with them. And he was very interested not in social capital as held by individuals, but social capital as created and maintained and perpetuated by civic organizations. So uh, when his book came out, everyone was saying, oh, this is his book about the decline of bowling leagues in America. <laughs> I mean, it's not really about that. He, he uses the bowling league as sort of a symbol of American civic life, but his argument is much broader. And so in the late 1990s, people that were looking at social change and social justice and activism were really thinking about this thesis that Putnam had introduced about the decline of social capital in the United States. And the other thing that was influencing mine and many other people's thoughts at this time was the sort of meteoric rise of email petitions. OK, so there's two kinds of email communication that are probably driving you insane. It's like the forwarded emails about cats or something from your family members, unless you love cats, in which case you love the emails. But the other is this phenomenon of email petitions. Oh, I signed this petition. You should sign it too. Or put your name on this petition. And you see them emerging around a wide range of issues. Maybe you love to get the petitions. In 1999, this was a somewhat new phenomenon. And many people credit or blame, depending on your perspective, the organization move on for really popularizing and disseminating widely the idea of the email petition. And if you remember this organization, they were founded in 1998 by two software engineers in Berkeley who started an online petition asking Congress to, quote, censure Bill President Clinton and move on. And uh, tens of thousands of people signed this petition. And it became clear that this was, in some way, a new venue or vehicle for activism. Now, petitions are not new. Email is not new. But this was a time in which the use of the online petition was really gaining traction. 
Okay, so it's 1999. We're listening to this talk by Doug McAdam. He's talking about some different things related to activism. And we're sitting in the audience thinking, okay, this is sort of a preeminent expert on social movements in the United States. Let's ask him. Is this the end of activism? Is this the end of in-person activism? Are we going to see sort of email petitions supplant uh, protest in the future? Very nice guy. His response was, no, of course not. That's insane. That uh, activism was, for the most part, not going to change. It was, for the most part, going to proceed the way that it always had. And basically, in the same way, uh, we were going to see activism continue. And he was wrong. Because guess what happened in November 1999? We have the Seattle WTO protest, referred to as some by the battle in Seattle, the battle of Seattle. There was a somewhat unfortunate movie made about it, starring Woody Harrelson. Also referred to as N30, because it took, took place around November 30th. So if you were at this protest, or you had friends that were there, or you were planning to go there, you might have hopefully thought it was going to be a decent-sized protest against the World Trade Organization. Maybe 10,000 people were going to show up. But for many people, myself included, I had no idea that this was happening, and I had no idea it was happening on the scale that it was happening. So the, the crowd estimates for this protest against the World Trade Organization range from 40,000 at the very conservative end of these crowd protests to somewhere around 100,000. And it dominated the news for many days and weeks and months afterwards. For many people who were watching these news reports, the idea that 100,000 people Activists interested in a wide range of very disparate issues from all over the United States and the world would descend on Seattle and engage in essentially militant street protest and sometimes somewhat violent confrontation with the police in 1999 was a little bit unheard of in many circles. But there were a few features of this activism that were very interesting, and, and the media made a, a lot of these features at the time, and people that study social movements since then have been very interested in sort of looking at and thinking about these features. So one thing that was very noteworthy about this event was that the protesters were incredibly militant. So many of them were very committed to nonviolent direct action. A very small minority was uh, promoting uh, property destruction, but the... Uh, intensity of the rhetoric and the lengths to which many of these protesters were willing to go to try to make a larger statement about globalization took many observers by surprise. Another interesting feature of these protests were that they, a lot of the facilitation, the mobilization for these protests took place over email, but they were indeed very in-person protests. This was not an email petition against the WTO by any stretch of the imagination. Two other interesting features. One is sort of this unusual alliances between different kinds of activists. And many people for years since were very obsessed with this Teamsters and Turtles. And I don't know the extent to which there were actually great uh, coalitions built between radical environmentalists and big rig truck drivers in the Northwest, maybe. But there are some great photos you know, of a person dressed up like a turtle, holding hands with a guy with a mesh hat worn non ironically. And uh, many people were interested in all the different kinds of activists that were coming together for this event. But the last thing that was very perplexing for observers is that this was a, movie, a movement that appeared, at least on the surface, to be leaderless, to be facilitated by a radically different form of organization that was intentionally decentralized. That unlike previous movements where there had been perhaps a charismatic speaker or somebody that was willing to stand out in front of the movement and claim to be the organizer or the leader of the event. Many of the people involved in mobilizing for the Seattle protest said publicly that there were no leaders. Now, I don't believe that. I think there were actually a lot of people uh, involved in very important leadership roles, but certainly in a different way, in a different style, and more self-consciously than previous forms of protest. So Seattle, as it turned out, was just the first of a series of large-scale protests in the early 2000s. So we have an Ap on April 16th, 2000, a big protest against the annual 
International Monetary Fund, World Bank meetings in Washington, D.C. In August 2000, we have huge street protests uh, against the Republican National Convention in Philadelphia. And interestingly, also that month, against the Democratic National Convention in Los Angeles. Then in September 2000, we have another big protest in Washington, D.C. against uh, uh, the G7 International Monetary Fund meeting. Now, certainly while all this is going on, there are other protests happening worldwide. The next really big one happens in July 2001 in Genoa, where hundreds of activists were injured and arrested, and one young activist actually died in the protest. And so you have this series of large-scale militant in-person protests taking place in 2000, 2001. And many people are asking the question, is this sort of a paradigm shift? Are we looking at a new future of activism that is going to be incredibly militant? And then September 11th happens. And many people argue that the political climate in this country changes and affects the enthusiasm and the momentum of a lot of these protests. And certainly, the law enforcement response to these protests really ramps up. And you see two really big, large-scale protests after that. And then this movement largely loses steam, many would argue, until Occupy. So you have uh, February 2000, no, November 2002, a very large protest in Florence, Italy, against the European Social Forum. And then February 2003, you have a global anti-war protest with coordinated, large-scale, in-person uh, actions. Uh, taking place worldwide. And these protests that I have on this timeline really uh, share a lot of the features of the Seattle protest. They're very militant. There's a um, sort of strain between uh, organizers about nonviolent direct action and property destruction. Email, social networking, internet is playing a huge role in facilitating these actions. You have these unusual alliances. You have sort of the Teamsters and Turtles of each of these events. And these movements also are really uh, presenting themselves as somewhat leaderless as well. So by the mid-2000s, around 2003, 2004, many people are asking this question again. What is the future of activism? Is this large-scale, in-person, militant protest going to continue? Is activism in the United States going to be focused on direct action? Is it going to be focused on in-person protest? And you start to see the increasing sophistication of activist groups across the world using innovative strategies like these big banner drops where they will like climb a crane in the middle of the night and drop a big banner. People are also asking questions at this time about the role of technology. Is the internet going to facilitate in-person activism like it has so far? Or will activism begin to play out largely in sort of the cyber realm? Are we going to move away from large-scale protests into uh, email petitions, email-facilitated protests? And others are raising questions about what are the issues that are going to motivate hundreds of thousands of people to come out in support of or in against uh, certain events? Are people going to be continue to be focused on global issues and global inequality? What role is global conflict or war going to play in motivating activism? Or are people going to shift and focus more on domestic inequality? But the last question that was really uh, an important one at the forefront of a lot of these discussions in the mid-2000s, and really in some way the question that drives my interest in this topic, is what role are organizations going to play in influencing or facilitating activism in the future? So you have organizations like uh, an organization called the Ruckus Society, which is actually has these training camps for people which teach them how to do things like these banner drops where they go and climb trees with equipment and learn how to drop things and get into things. And I don't know, I've never been to one. Uh, there's a discussion about organizations like Move On. Are they really going to influence the future of the um, social justice movements in the United States by pushing for more forms of cyber activism? And others were asking hard questions about the role of philanthropic and corporate foundations in promoting or opposing uh, social justice movements at this time. 
So in 2007, uh, this book is published that's based on some essays that had been circulating for several years called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded. And it's sort of a play on that Gil Scott Heron song, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. But the purpose of this book is to really lay out, to try to lay out an argument about how philanthropic foundations that fund uh, nonprofits and other sort of community-based organizations are really trying to push these organizations away from direct action and sort of militant protest and into more direct service provision, other kinds of activities. It's an interesting book, a little hit or miss, the different chapters, but very interesting. And in this book, they talk a lot about the rise of charitable giving in the United States, both among individuals and uh, corporate and philanthropic foundations. And one uh, piece of data that's thrown around a lot in this book is that in 1955, total charitable giving in the U.S. was around $7.7 .7 billion. And by 1998, it was about $175 billion. And so many were asking about what role are philanthropic or corporate foundations going to play either in supporting activism in the future or restraining it. And the book basically argued that many philanthropic foundations strategically direct how the money that they donate to nonprofits gets dispersed and they allocate money with strings attached. And many people involved with this book and sort of the movement around uh, talking about what they call the nonprofit industrial complex. This is a favorite game. You just add industrial complex to the end of your thing. But yeah, it's interesting. Art. But the, uh, the question that they raised or the concern that they raised was to what extent are these philanthropic foundations really sort of changing the dynamics or the playing field in which activism is occurring. So by 2005, I'm in graduate school still, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to pick a dissertation topic. And I become very interested in another type of activism or social justice work that has slowly been building steam throughout the 1990s. And it's in some ways, you know, in the Superman series where some, he would go to Bizarro World and there's like Bizarro. I don't, I'm not a comic book, you know what I'm talking about? And there's like an alternative universe that's totally different than the other universe. In many ways, this type of activism that's building in this time is like a bizarro world to this in-person militant protest that's taking place throughout the early 2000s. And so I call this form of activism venture activism, and I believe that it shares some really interesting parallels with venture capitalism. Now, I realize this seems crazy, but if you can just hang in there with me, maybe I'll convince you by the end. Okay, so venture activism, and this is sort of the crux of what I'm trying to argue in this book that I'm writing, shares some key features with venture capitalism. So the first is that venture activist organizations like venture capitalists are trying to promote, promote some sort of innovation or change in the sectors that they work in. And I focused on two organizations. One was trying to um, promote innovation within the public education system. The other was trying to promote innovation within the organized labor movement in the US. But the idea is that these organizations are strategically using their resources to try to create change and to try to promote new ideas in some sort of sector. Like venture capitalists, venture activists also try to recruit and support change agents that have the potential to innovate or introduce new ideas into their sector, but need some additional support to do so. So I'm calling them needy, not in the sense that they have a lot of emotional needs, although uh, interestingly, uh, many people I interviewed, but um, <laughs> what I mean is that they need some help from someone else to become agents of change inside these two uh, arenas. Public education, organized labor in this sense. Okay, so like venture capitalists, venture activist organizations infuse a tremendous amount of resources into these change agents. So in the case of the two organizations that I studied, they infused them with training, with resources, with experience, and then tried to sort of send them out into public schools and labor unions to become innovators and change agents in those environments. And so if you have studied or read anything about venture capitalism, you know that there's this process by which venture capitalists 
incubate entrepreneurs and uh, innovators. They give them resources. Sometimes they give them an office space. Sometimes they just give them a lot of money. And the idea is that you sort of pump them full of resources and then send them out to make, a, make an important impact or make a change in the market. And again, with venture activism, you're not totally talking about the market. You're talking about these other institutional settings, but basically the same. Okay. But venture activists sort of are talking about the market in a sense. And this is the part of the argument that might seem the craziest. But to me, it's really the key to the whole sort of discussion that I'm trying to open up. So like venture capitalists, venture activists have a strong affinity for the private sector. That they really rely upon the private sector. They see it as a source of innovation, of energy, of resources. And while venture capitalists seek to make profits, venture activists don't. They seem to make, they seek to make uh, social change and social justice, but they really try to do it by garnering the resources available in the private sector. And if anyone has read in recent years about social entrepreneurs, people that use the private market to uh, try to make change as opposed to relying upon uh, nonprofits or government entities or state policy, this is sort of a similar theme. So maybe some people have read about uh, micro lending or other sorts of um, market driven uh, social change efforts. Okay, so in this book, that, and I just want to tell you a little bit about these two organizations and then we'll get to some evidence. So in this book that I'm writing, I really focus on two venture activist organizations. One you may have heard of and one you may not have for reasons we can get into later. Uh, so the first organization that I look at is an organization called Teach for America. It's founded in 1989 by a woman named Wendy Kopp, who develops the blueprint for this organization in her senior thesis at Princeton University in sociology. And uh, she comes up with this idea of a national teacher corps. And she's looking out in 1989. Uh, Wendy Kopp, by the way, was not a student activist in the slightest. She was the president of a sort of student business group that was sort of interested in social policy, but really coming at it from more of a business than an activist approach. But she was very interested in trying to address the teacher shortage in uh, low-income areas of the US, but also in trying to think about how to raise the profile and the prestige of teaching. So her idea was to recruit high-achieving recent college grads from fancy colleges across the country and uh, offer them competitive slots in a program where they would work for two years as a regular classroom teacher. They would get paid like a classroom teacher. They would have a classroom. They would wear a tie. They would work with some cute children. And the idea was that at the end of these two years, these young people would do two things. One is that they would work really hard and try to motivate their students to do well and sort of infuse these schools with a tremendous amount of optimism and energy. But the other idea, and really the main purpose of this organization, was that then after those two years, these young people would sort of move on to their real careers, their real lives. And they would go and they would take their experiences that they had gained in these two years in the public schools, and they would use those experiences to shape their support of public education or public school reform. The program was really not designed to make long-term career teachers, and for this reason it's come under a lot of criticism in different uh, arenas. But it was really focused on putting these sort of energetic, available, hardworking, high-achieving young people into failing schools to try to give them a little bit of spark or a little bit of innovation. And for Teach for America, private sector funding was a huge part of how the program developed and uh, of how the program has continued to exist over the years. So Wendy Kopp is from Dallas, Texas. She went to a very uh, fancy public school in a neighborhood in Dallas called Highland Park. And she went back to Dallas to do some fundraising the summer after her senior year. And one of the first people that she hit up for money was Ross Perot, who she had some connection to through Dallas. And Ross Perot ended up being the first funder of Teach for America. And he gave them sort of a challenge grant, and they matched it. And then she's been uh, running what is an incredibly efficient, interesting, somewhat controversial organization since then. 
Today's top funders of Teach for America are their Walton Family Foundation, they're sort of the philanthropic foundation affiliated with Walmart, and Wachovia Bank is a huge funder of Teach for America for reasons that I could never get anyone to explain to me. Uh, but they love it. They put on a big golf tournament every year. And to get the money. Okay, so in 1995, Teach for America's operating budget was about $40.5 million. Today, it is $192.3 million. And a very small percentage of those funds come from the public sector, come from the government. So the other organization that I compared Teach for America to is this organization called the AFL-CIO Organizing Institute. It's a project of the AFL-CIO, which is the umbrella organization for organized labor in the US. And the purpose of this organization was to recruit young people, mostly, although they would never say that because they're discrimination. Anyway, uh, to recruit young people to work and train them in a very particular way of being a union organizer and put them through this sort of boot camp training experience and then send them out into labor unions across the United States to bring their energy, their enthusiasm, their innovative new ideas, and to really try to shake things up a little bit inside organized labor. As you can imagine, this is a challenging organizational dynamic for an organization that's funded and exists within the umbrella organization for all the unions. And for that reason, you can imagine that it did not experience the meteoric growth of Teach for America. But anyways, it's founded by a guy named Richard Benzinger, who was a union organizer for the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union in Colorado and all around the United States. He's recently been in the news a lot because he last year was hired to be the chief organizer for the Auto Workers Union in Detroit. And he's sort of, uh, if you Google him, you can get some interesting things. Also, there's an optometrist in Seattle named Richard Benzinger. So my Google alerts always send me things about glaucoma or something. I can't figure out how to get it to stop. Okay, so the idea was to sort of create a new generation of union organizers who are trained in different strategies and tactics with the idea that their approach to organizing and activism would sort of catch on and uh, change the culture of organizing within labor unions. And oftentimes when we think about union organizers or labor unions to the extent that we do, maybe we have that image of Norma Ray with Sally Fields holding up the sign that says union, very sweaty in a textile plant. The reality of this work is that it's not nearly that dramatic or sexy, but really it's about people going to other people's houses and having conversations with them about their work. And then, uh, so I put this little picture of two people hanging out on the porch because that's really what it looks like more than Sally Fields. Okay, so these are these two organizations. And um, they both, to me, really typify this uh, new approach to activism that starts building steam in the 1990s and has continued to be very influential today. What's my time check? 28? Okay. And I, I was really trying to decide today what to talk about. And I thought I would focus on an element of venture activism that I think is really interesting and really different than more traditional approaches to activism and social justice. So I call this doing good while doing well. And I'm going to explain a little bit about it. But what I started to notice as I interviewed these 120 activists and staff and trainers and mentors was that many of the young people that were involved in these venture activist organizations, when asked how they got involved, had a much less dramatic uh, story than the kinds of stories you heard when you read books about civil rights activists or feminists or uh, people involved in the environmental movement or the anti-nukes movement in the 1980s. And what, you really st what I really started to see that was very interesting is these young people talking very unapologetically about how they were interested in getting involved in this kind of activism because it was going to help them in some way. Now they still had this narrative of sort of helping society or poor children, I want to help them in some way. But the, in, the individualization of their motivations really st stuck out at me. And I'm going to just give you some examples about the way in which people talked about what motivated them to do this activist work, the way that they viewed the benefits to them in the present and also the sort of future benefits of this activism. And as I'm talking about this, I'm going to show you some quotes from interviews that I conducted that I've changed. They're all fake names, so everyone's confidentiality is maintained. But uh, as I'm sort of showing you these quotes, I hope you'll keep in the back of your mind whatever idea you might have 
about what other kinds of people involved in other kinds of activism might say were the reasons for getting involved. Because some of these are different and uh, I think raise some interesting questions about the future of activism in the US. So I'm gonna talk, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about sort of student loans, about access and this idea that activism to many of the young people involved in these venture activist organizations is really perceived as a good job and also to think a little bit about how involvement in venture activism can help people's future career. Okay, so I ask this sort of standard question in these interviews and I say why, when you first heard about this organization, Teach for America or the Organizing Institute, why did you decide to do it? And many people just said, listen, uh, I had these huge student loans and I needed to do something that was gonna either defer them or deal with it. So this one person, Kyle, says to me, well, the idea that I could get some of my student loans wiped off if I joined Teach for America was huge. He said, I had like $40,000 in loans. And so that was a very attract attractive incentive. Teach for America has partnered with um, um, the AmeriCorps program and at the end of the two years, the people that successfully complete their service get an education award. Um, I can't remember the amount. But uh, they, they do get a pretty significant education award. And for many people that got involved in this program that I interviewed, this was an important motivator. And this is increasingly important as the 90s carry on and move into the 2000s, as the cost of college skyrockets, as the ratio for average students of loans to grants really starts to change and students are graduating from colleges in many cases with many, many more student loans than previous generations. And then as we see the rise in college attendance and graduation, graduate school or some sort of advanced degree becomes increasingly an important credential for people to be competitive in the labor market. And so for many young people graduating from college with 20, 40, 60, 80, 100,000 dollars worth of student loans, the idea of then later going back to grad school for many people was quite crippling financially and emotionally. And a program like Teach for America that offers uh, a two-year deferment on your loan payments and then this pretty good chunk, I think it's about $9,000 after two years, towards your student loans was very attractive. Okay, so another reason that when I asked people why did you get involved in this kind of social justice work, uh, for some people, the idea of gaining access into public education or organized labor was really important to them. And these were people that sort of entered these organizations with a long-term uh, interest and a present interest in working in the public schools, but they had faced some pretty serious barriers to get inside these two institutions. So in the organized labor movement, there are many informal entrance barriers. Some uh, labor unions have a rule that they will only hire people that have previously been members of the union. So if you're a young 22-year-old interested in workplace issues or workplace justice, it might be quite hard for you to get employed by a labor union or get involved in that way if you've never been a member of a labor union before. And for young people thinking about going into teaching but who had not come uh, out of a school of education, the formal entrance barriers into public education are quite important. So there are certain credentials or certain tests or certain coursework that makes it hard, unless you've been planning for that in many states, to jump into public education. So some of these young people talked about access as a motivation for getting involved in these organizations. So a woman named Angie, that it actually turned out we had gone to college together when I was sort of ran I randomly picked these names and I was interviewing her. And I had to pretend the whole time I never told her. Or okay, so she says, I saw Teach for America as my ticket to my future. I knew that I was going to be a teacher and that I was going to be in education. I knew that Teach for America was my ticket to becoming a teacher. It was going to be a lot harder of a struggle if I did it another way. But essentially, through this organization, she could get right into the classroom after six weeks of summer training. And uh, she was very interested in that. Now the third sort of category that I put in this doing good while doing well is what I sort of think about as sort of this idea that activism becomes to many young people involved in venture activism. It appears to be a good job. So for some young people that had been doing some sort of activist or social justice work before they applied to the organizing institute, union organizing is actually 
a pretty sweet gig compared to being some sort of nonprofit worker or community organizer. Unions, uh, as organizations that advocate for workers' rights and higher pay and benefits for their members, generally tend to be organizations that pay their staff pretty decent and give them good benefits because they would it would be a problem for them philosophically if they didn't. Although there are some exceptions I can tell you about once I take the mic off. Okay, so uh, Miranda, a person I interviewed, a uh, staff person for the Organizing Institute, when I asked her who are the people that apply and why do they apply, she said, sometimes people that apply to the Organizing Institute are applying to work for our program for very practical reasons. Like I've been doing community organizing for years, it's what I love, it's what I want to be doing, but man, I want to make a living. So in that situation, the labor movement is perfect. And so for many of these uh, young people that came to participate in the Organizing Institute, it was just quite technically a better job to be involved in this venture activist organization than other kinds of work that they were doing. Many uh, working class applicants that I interviewed, people that participated in these two organizations, especially young people from working class backgrounds that participated in the Organizing Institute, considered organizing to be a really good job compared to other jobs they had had, compared to jobs that their parents had had, or compared to jobs that they envisioned themselves holding if they didn't finish college. And there was a small but interesting number of people in my sample who had decided to become involved in the Organizing Institute because they had decided in their junior or senior year to drop out of college that came from working class backgrounds. So one person, James, explained to me, I really saw the value of the job. He's talking about becoming a union organizer. Before that, I didn't have any health insurance. And I also saw, this is, a, pardon my friend, this is a damn good job. My mom's a waitress. She wasn't making, when I started becoming a union organizer, I was making more than her. I just saw the value of the job as well but also saw that this is a significant way to make change. So what's interesting to me about these sort of present motivations of young activists involved in these venture activist organizations is that they're really boldly and unselfconsciously talking about activism as something that's gonna benefit them in the present. And for the Teach for America participants, this idea of sort of the future benefit of the organization becomes hugely important by the mid-2000s. So many people saw participation in venture activism, especially the young people that were involved in Teach for America, as a way to forward their own career goals. So this woman Genevieve said, when she's describing the other people in her summer training institute, says, oh, there's a mix of people. Some were very interested in teaching, and then there were other students who were clear about, I just want to teach for two years, and then I want to go into an MBA program, or I'm going to law school, or what I really want to do is be a doctor, but this would be good for me to do for a couple of years. And when Genevieve says good, she means good both in doing good, helping others, contributing to education equality or improving the public education system, but also good in that the experience will propel her forward into her real career. And the reason that this is a much more salient uh, uh, factor for Teach for America participants, it's 40 minutes, okay probably about 10 more minutes, is that uh, Teach for America is an incredibly selective organization. If you've ever read anything about them, you'll know that they really pride themselves on accepting about 11, 10, 12 percent of their applicant pool. So in 2011, 48,000 people applied to be part of Teach for America, and they accepted 5,280 people. This is an 11 percent acceptance rate. So as you can imagine, employers, graduate schools, professional school programs, uh, other sorts of uh, training programs view Teach for America as a very prestigious, selective post-grad uh, opportunity. And this is true across many fields that have nothing to do with education. And so many young people, especially today, as Teach for America really promotes that low acceptance rate, see doing Teach for America as a mark on their resume that is in many ways going to really distinguish them from their peers. So the logical next question is, why are all these people involved in venture activism so individually motivated? That certainly they talked about, oh, I want to help people, I want to do good, but the real emphasis of their discussion with me in a completely confidential interview uh, where they knew that no one was going to know what they said was very unselfconsciously, it's really going to help me, and I knew that when I started to do it. This is true more so of the Teach for America participants, but certainly the union participants are, as well. Well, one explanation could be generational factors. Many of the young people that 
uh, are doing Teach for America today are members of what's sometimes called Generation Y or the Millennial Generation, which is a generation that starts at around uh, 1982 and ends in 2001. Generally, people coming of age around 2000 and uh, continuing on. And that, you know, the, there's lots of sort of, uh, there's a whole uh, cottage industry of books about different generations. And Generation Y is often portrayed, rightly or wrongly, as a generation that really embraces free market principles, that engages in what sometimes is consult, called like socially conservative behavior, abstinence from drug experimentation and premarital sex. Also, some people say underage drinking. Okay, uh, they're also referred to as sort of the trophy generation, this idea that they're very fixated on awards and rewards for participation in certain things, and that they are more so than other generations really have a tendency to delay rites of passage and to switch jobs many times before settling on a career. So one explanation could be, well, these are just sort of, this is a form of activism that really dovetailed nicely with a generation that was really focused on uh, prestige and achievement and that maybe didn't have some of the political or ideological commitment of previous generations. And I think this is a decent explanation for why we see this interest in venture activism during this time. But I also spent a lot of time watching how the organization recruited and selected people. So I would sort of sit at a table with a recruiter in college campuses in Seattle and Portland and Los Angeles and watch the recruiter interview people and talk to them and go to their public meetings. And it was very clear that the organization was focusing a lot of its recruitment materials and message around the prestige of the organization. And that this really was certainly resonating with the generation, but also was a message carefully crafted by the organization. So one of my observations in January of 2006, the recruiter is telling somebody that might apply to the program, well, Teach for America has relationships with over 60 graduate schools. All of the top 10 law schools offer deferrals to people who do Teach for America. Some schools have scholarships that are available to most first year law students. Most law schools don't even offer deferrals generally. And then the person said, oh, the dean of Yale Law School has said that doing a program like Teach for America makes people better applicants. So this is just a really interesting, I think it's very interesting, hopefully you do too, uh, an interesting take on activism where you have somebody saying, well, the dean of Yale Law School is going to love it if you do this program. Very different than people involved in lunch counter sit-ins or... Uh, radical environmental activism in the 1990s, very different than the Teamsters and Turtles in Seattle, who in some sense are engaged in activism despite the costs that they might pay, both uh, in terms of uh, uh, being arrested, maybe being hurt in some way during the protest, or certainly uh, em employer, you know, you're not gonna, I mean, maybe you would put this on your resume, oh, I you know, got arrested at the WTO. <laughs> that would help you in some situations but not at all the way that participating in venture activism would be. I'm gonna skip this next one. So the interesting thing, and this is my last sort of slide and then I'll start to conclude, is that then you would think, okay, well you have these venture activist organizations recruiting people in a certain way, appealing to a certain kind of applicant, wildly successful, especially by 2012 in the case of Teach for America. So what are the sort of ideological beliefs of people involved in this form of activism? And what was very surprising to me as I interviewed and observed both of these organizations doing selection, taking all the applicants and deciding, was that personal politics or sort of ideology or political beliefs were incredibly marginal to the selection process in these two organizations. So one person who I named Scarlett, who's a staff member for Teach for America, explained to me, there are certain things I'll start by saying we don't look for. Political affiliation is of zero relevance. It happens that most of our core members are on one end of the political spectrum, but not all. There's no correlation. The things we look for are, do people believe that all kids can achieve? So in addition to this uh, desire to have their participants really believe that low-income kids can, are smart and are capable of being successful, Teach for America in particular as an organization looks for uh, leadership experience, they look for demonstrated achievement or accomplishment in terms of GPAs, awards, scholarships, and they really try to look at student leaders across campus and figure out who is the most effective leader with the idea that then they'll be effective in the classroom. And every time I went out with a recruiter on campus, which I spent several weeks doing, they 
operated sort of like headhunters on the college campus. And they actually, on many campuses, not the University of Montana, I don't think, have sort of a team of undergrad interns who are like their assistant headhunters. And their job is to go through the lists of all the campus organizations and send personal emails to every head of an organization. And they are fastidious about reaching out to the head of the Republican club and the Democrat club, the head of the business club on campus, the head of all these different kinds of political organizations. Because according to the organization, and I actually think this is really true, they don't care what, how you vote or what your perspective on the world might be politically as long as you're sort of an effective, high energy kind of person. Okay, so you would might say, okay, maybe we can imagine this for a teaching organization, but there's no way that a labor union also wants to hire people. They don't care about their political affiliation. Now, similar to Teach for America, the, the organizing institute says, okay, you have to think unions are good in order to do this program. But aside from that, we don't really care what your politics are. And in fact, I saw time and time again people with politics that we might identify as being radical or extremely left were called out of the applicant pool routinely because the organization did not necessarily want them. So this woman, Patricia, who's a staffer for the OI, said, some of the founders of the Organizing Institute felt like we should get average people, not progressives. I came into the labor movement thinking this is a door opening for activists and progressives to get into the labor movement, but that was not the concept. The original idea was to get people who could do the work. And the Organizing Institute, your sort of baseline is that you have to think unions are good, but your main qualifications are gonna be that you're flexible, that you can travel and relocate, you can work extremely long hours, and you are good at sort of maintaining relationships with people. So close, okay. So we have these two organizations. Maybe at this point you're thinking, well, okay, there's these two sort of weird organizations. They're kind of similar, not really. Uh, I'm not convinced this is actually a thing. I'm gonna tell you. Okay, so venture activism, I think, is sort of the untold story of activism 1990s to today. And certainly you see these two organizations, Teach for America and the Organizing Institute, having a tremendous impact, not only across the United States, but across the world. So Teach for America has inspired many uh, organizations that would actually say we're kind of a copycat of Teach for America. Across the US, you have these regional or city-focused, short-term, competitive, high-prestige teaching programs like the New York Teaching Fellows, the New Teacher Project. Internationally, you have these programs popping up all the time. There's one called Teach for India or Teach for Australia, Teach UK. And often, I have a little Google alert for these things. So I get these articles and they say, oh, you know, Wendy Kopp, the founder of Teach for America, came and cut the ribbon on the first day of Teach UK program. And they consulted with them. And in many ways, they replicated the system that Teach for America created. And although the Organizing Institute is much, uh, has a much smaller profile than Teach for America, it has had a huge impact also, not only in the organized labor. So there are similar programs that really are modeled right almost identically after the Organizing Institute among some large public sector unions, the Service Employees International Union. There are programs that look very similar to the Organizing Institute in Australia, in the UK, in Canada. Community organi organizations have sort of come together and created training programs that look very similar to the OI. There was one called Training for Careers in Community Organizing in the 90s, and there's one that's still going today called the Minority Activist Apprenticeship Program, or MAP. And in many cases, these Teach for America copycat organizations, I don't mean that in a negative way at all, and these uh, Organizing Institute copycat organizations, in many ways they actually go out and they cherry pick a staff member from that organization and they say, hey, will you come work for us and create like a mini Teach for America in this other country? And this is certainly the case within labor unions who love to steal each other's staff all the time. Okay, so in, in addition to this, there's this interesting organization that is now somewhat higher profile than the Organizing Institute, and it has a very uh, unimaginative name. It's called the New Organizing Institute, and it trains young people in cyber organizing and sort of e-organizing, and mostly trains young people to use uh, technology to support political campaigns. And it was founded in the mid 2000s by a guy that had actually gone through the Organizing Institute and worked as a union organizer for several years and then uh, went on to be the head of technology, tech, uh, sort of e-organizing, I think for the Kerry campaign, and um, went on to found this organization. You could look them up. Okay. 
So what explains the rise of venture activism starting in 1989 and going to today? Well, hopefully I presented you with some possible explanations. One are these sort of generational characteristics. Maybe there's something about millennials, their sort of competitiveness, their individualistic focus, their sort of political mainstreamness, as some people call them. Some people refer to the millennials as participators. They're very interested in volunteering and civic engagement. Maybe this is an explanation that these organizations have sort of captured the imagination of a certain generation. Maybe the economic context is really important for understanding the rise of uh, venture activism as well. As higher education becomes much more competitive, as the job market becomes much more competitive, we see a rise of a kind of activism that's very different from previous generations. Previous generations participated, especially in a little bit more marginal organizations, despite the impact it might have on their credibility, on their reputation, on their career. Whereas people participate in venture activism because, in large part, it actually helps them. It's actually a resume booster. And this is a way in which it's really different than other forms of activism, especially this type of uh, more uh, direct action mass protest we saw in Seattle. So other economic contexts are the role of corporate philanthropic influences in the social change arena. Pol Teach for America, heavily funded by corporate uh, philanthropic, uh, corporate foundations, philanthropic foundations, and have very deep, very rich, very ongoing uh, relationships to Wachovia Bank, Walton Family Foundation, stuff like that. But I want to leave you with one alternate explanation, that maybe the political environment is just as, if not more, convincing of an explanation for the rise of venture activism. We've seen, I believe, in the past 15 years, a rise in enthusiasm for somewhat more mainstream, less sort of dangerous, less radical forms of civic engagement, especially among young people. From the sort of Deaniacs, remember that? The young people that loved Howard Dean in 2000. I found all these pictures of him doing that yell. Remember when he did that and it was caught on YouTube? Okay, so uh, to sort of the mass and uh, great enthusiasm for Obama in 2008 among progressive young people, we also have seen a tremendous rise in interest in civic engagement and service. So maybe part of the explanation is uh, sort of this enthusiasm among young people in some ways for sort of more mainstream forms of civic engagement, and I really think venture activism would fall in that category. And I would just say we also can't ignore the influence of sort of the post 9-11 political climate, the real clamp down in some ways by uh, law enforcement on these big scale protests and how a lot of the rhetoric about 9-11 might have shaped young people's interest in going into something like Teach for America as opposed to becoming a Teamster and Turtle person. Yep. Okay, so uh, I get, I'm not really answering this question. <laughs> I realize it's very annoying. Uh, I don't know what the future of activism is in the US. I would argue that the role of professional change agents and venture activism cannot be ignored. It needs to be something that we think about and keep at the forefront of our discussion. Maybe some of you are convinced that the future of activism is going to be more mass uh, direct action protest. Maybe others are more convinced that activism is really going to play out in the political arena. Maybe you have completely different ideas entirely, and I would love to hear them. So thank you. Um, may we have the house lights? Do you think, um, Jay? Oh, good. Thank you. Thanks a million, Daisy. Daisy's only been with us since 2009, so I think she's a real find. Um, so I'm glad you're here with us. Thank you. Um, so as usual, we'll now get into the question and answer. I have a mic. Uh, Daisy, did you want to use this one? Or are I'll you use okay this with one. That's fine, yeah. Okay, I have a mic, and Jay has a mic. So just put up your hands if you have a question to ask, and, uh, and we'll get to you. Hi, Daisy. Thanks, nice work. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you think the difference is less one of kind of demographics and more one based on the topic of the activism. So, like, to me, there's a really strong distinction between things that are very controversial and inspire passion versus, say, education and union organizing, which are not, frankly, quite as 
as passionately controversial. And I, I was really struck because I was listening to the BBC today and I heard an interview with a doctor in Syria and he said, yes, there is a real cost. We're trying to save lives. This is hell. This is terrifying. All these other doctors have been killed, but we have no choice. So activism in the face of like great cost is only inspired by great passion, but activism when there's not a cost but a benefit, you can be kind of wishy-washy about it. So I wonder if it's more a question of the topic than of some broader <coughs> demographic. Yeah. Well, I think that's an interesting question. I think it could be definitely true of education. In one sense, it's not really that controversial to say, you know, Teach for America's slogan is one day all children will have, in ex I used to know it, excellent education or access to excellent education. And I, I don't know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that would say no. <laughs> you know, some children should get a terrible education based on where they live and they should just, de they deserve it. So I think you're right that education is a less controversial topic, although uh, within, and I think there's no coincidence that this is an organization that operates much more comfortably and fluidly with support from uh, conservatives and liberals and people that are very progressive. Many of them come together and support some of the things that Teach for America is doing. I don't know if I agree with you about union organizing. I think it's not necessarily a topic well, I don't even know if it's true that it's not really in the news because of that whole thing in Wisconsin last year. I mean, I think actually the topic of organized labor and labor unions is pretty controversial and pretty divisive in the US, even though it's an issue that's not on our radar as much as it used to be. And so uh, I used to be a union organizer, and my personal philosophy was never tell people on the plane what you do, because after maybe five plane trips and somebody's, what do you do? I'm a union organizer. Wow, you know. And uh, you, you like can't, you're in the center seat and you can't escape and somebody's screaming at you about something. And um, So I don't know. I think that unions are, in this political moment, pretty controversial. I think unionized public sector workers are really at the center of some intense conversations we're having about the economy, about the future of pensions, the public sector. And uh, I think especially in other parts of the country, they're very polarizing and uh, confrontational. But I think your point is really well taken about education and that there are people that have very uh, radical beliefs on the right and left about education, but many people could agree on a series of principles that aren't that controversial. Yeah, thank you. Looking at the question what's the future of activism. Have you looked at percentage of the population that's involved in some activist activity across different X, Y generations, baby boomers? And I guess what I'm wondering is, is activism, does it take different forms across these different groups, but are the number of people who are involved, the percentage of the population involved, different? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm going to use a time-honored cop-out that qualitative researchers love, which is the, if you do qualitative research, you can tell people some rich things about a small group, but you can't really, you shouldn't, and you can't really say anything about whether these trends apply to the whole population, because I sampled certain kinds of people involved in certain kinds of organizations that aren't necessarily representative of the population. I know that many people that study generations are interested in this question. They're um, especially interested in it in relation to questions of service and civic engagement. And that many people that have studied Generation Y or the millennials say that this is a generation with an extraordinary commitment and interest in civic engagement, much more so than Generation X. And Maybe there are previous generations that also shared that sort of spirit, but um, I think that's how, that's how people would talk about sort of activism generationally, is they would mostly look at sort of civic engagement, volunteerism, and there is that data. Peop there's a large uh, data set of college freshmen. I think that's done every year, every few years out of UCLA. And they publish a big report about like, you know, the college freshman in 2012 and they try to make some generational claims. I don't know enough about it and 
it, it could be true that the percentage of people involved in this is similar, but they play it out in different ways. Um, I have no way of knowing that because of the way that I ask the question and answer it. But um, yeah, I, would, I don't know if, if actually this generation is more engaged than previous generations. I'm in Generation X, and we get beat up on all the time for being selfish. And mm -hmm. but doesn't every new generation get told that they're selfish? Anyway, uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. So, in your conversations with the people that you interviewed, was were there any instances of people saying that maybe they were very passionate or very motivated, but they had done somewhat of like a, like a cost-benefit analysis? Like, we have much more historical information about strategies and tactics, maybe it's from more radical groups, um, and maybe those have had varying levels of success in causing change in, in, different, in different ways. So maybe I'm just curious if that had ever come up as like they had like seen the risks and wanted to go this more safer route because not only would it have personal benefits, but maybe they'd be able to achieve some level of success mm -hmm. in other in safer ways. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And this was a thing that was really interesting to me about the research. When I was putting together the research project, my advisor, who also is sort of a labor union scholar, said, okay, everyone that works for this union organization, they're gonna be red diaper babies. Their parents are gonna be these radicals and they're gonna be these radicals. And my favorite interview that I did was, I think typifies many of the people in both of the programs I interviewed. And so one of my questions was, okay, so you applied to this organization and you got accepted. What else were you considering at the time? And how did you decide to do this over the other? And this woman that was a union organizer, she'd been a union organizer for five years, traveled all around. She said, well, you know, my other option was to go to Vail and be a ski instructor. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's so interesting. So. Uh, and she's like, yeah, I mean, it seemed to me, you know, I really love skiing, and so it was like that, or the union thing. I don't know, I just went with the union thing. And I thought, this is not at all the kind of person that I thought would be involved in this activism, which, although, Rebecca, you're right, it's not high risk, and it's not as controversial as other kinds of activism, but these are people who, for the most part, are working 60, 70 hours a day. In the case of the union people, they work 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week, travel extensively. It's very... Uh, taxing in terms of the hours and the work, although it's not risky, really. Well, some of the union people had some funny stories. Okay, but um, what was your question? Okay, so what was interesting to me was that many of these young people were not activists. They were not scholars of social movements. They were not people that said, oh, I'm going to make this sort of rational choice between this and this, and this is going to be the most effective way to make change. That the many of, not all, many of the people that I interviewed struck me as extraordinarily and shockingly sort of, I mean, I think apolitical has these negative connotations, I don't mean, but uh, these were not people that had maybe had extensive experience or knowledge of social movements. And that many of them were deciding between things like, well, I was going to, you know, do work as a ski instructor or a union organizer. And that what was fascinating to me in the interview, and you know, you're a qualitative researcher, you're not supposed to be like, what? <laughs> but I would ask these sort of pro, what did your friends think about this? And to them, there was not a big difference in these two options. Although to me, especially with the union program, they're very different. And um, I thought, I expected to find a lot more of what you were talking about, and I, I didn't, and it was interesting to me. I have a question for you. Um, did you know you wanted to get into something like activism or this kind of research when you went into sociology? Or why did you choose sociology? Or could you have been a ski instructor in Vail and instead? I've really only been skiing once. <laughs> this is a horrifying experience. Nobody told me that you do the wedge thing and that slows you down. They told me I wasn't paying attention. so I No guts, down. no glory. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, I went to grad school thinking I was going to study sociology of culture. I had a totally different interest. I had done some work for labor unions before grad school, and so I kind of got swooped up by an advisor, and sh she convinced me to study unions. It was somewhat random. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't, you know, it's like every, I have no idea why. Well, I'm why. glad you I, came here instead yeah, of skiing. Or I, don't know, I don't know why I became a, so I mean, I know now why I became a sociologist, but I think at the time it was a, 
it was sort of a random choice between two things that seemed different. Don't you think that always happens? I mean, <laughs> often happens? You just I thought I knew what was happening when I was making it. No. I, 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 just, I, I love what I do, and I, um, there's a rich tradition in sociology of studying social movements, so it's not surprising to me that I ended up in this area, but it wasn't my intention when I started grad school. Where would you put Peace Corps in line of venture activism? Well, uh, the Peace Corps is interesting, and I actually had this kind of hilarious experience. I, I was basically like kind of a creepy hanger on to these staffers of these organizations, and I would just kind of follow them around for weeks, you know, taking them. And one time I was spending a week with a recruiter for Teach for America in Seattle, and we were at a sort of job fair or some sort of like, some sort of fair at um, Seattle University. And we're sitting behind the table with all the Teach for America stuff, and we're sort of chit-chatting. And I said to her, what about Peace Corps? You know, or I, would be, I said, who's your competitor? Who, what other kinds of things are people interested in who are applying to Teach for America? Peace Corps? And she said, no, we don't want the same kind of people. Basically, we don't want do-gooders. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in high energy, high achieving people with leadership experience who are going to go into these schools and do something spectacular for two years and then do something else. But then she sent me over to the Peace Corps table to do some reconnaissance. And um, Peace Corps is interesting because its application process has also gotten more competitive, not at the level of Teach for America, but the in, from what I understand, this is just uh, I have not done any sort of serious research on it, but from what I understand, interest in Peace Corps uh, has also spiked during this time period. And I think what Teach for America would say is the difference, and certainly the Organizing Institute would say this too, is that they attract a different kind of person, although on the surface it seems like a similar kind of person might be interested in them. I didn't interview anybody. I did 80 in, in two hour long interviews with young people that had participated in these programs. And I didn't interview anybody who also had applied to Peace Corps. Um, mostly it was people that had applied to grad school and didn't get in or applied and deferred it to do one of these programs. Many people were thinking about law school down the line and many of them went to law school, especially the union people. But uh, it was some, in some way, it was a different demographic. Although if you read the Teach for America promotional material, there's a lot of talk about make a change, help the world. So, so it seems like it would attract the same kind of person. But from my experience, it, it didn't really. And I don't totally know why that is. But. Um, thank you for um, everything you brought to us tonight. I'm not sure I can, I'm going to try the best I can to articulate this, this question, but I think that the, the examples that you, um, you're giving us are, are a sort of um, a repetition of what, what we've seen in the past, is that um, radical leaders in the past have, have articulated visions that have energized a lot of people. I'm um, talking about like the, the early part of the... Um, the, the 1900s, and then you know, through an economic circumstance or because of a war, that stuff just kind of fell away. And like one of the things I'm thinking of is when that people have said that uh, um, we were pretty close to changing our economic system in the Great Depression because of the labor unions, because of the workers, and it was Roosevelt and his New Deal era stuff that actually saved capitalism. So and then and then then that that kind of disappeared because of uh, all sorts of reasons. But in in this case, in that case, it was an econ there was an economic component, but also there was a, a right now. I think what's happening or what we've seen since the 70s, 60s and 70s is a failure of the leadership in these organizations to articulate some new visions that would that would it, that would invigorate and attract people to these kind of positions. And so basically all that, there, there's, there's no vision, there's no, there's no magnet for people to want to come to these organizations and work for a new vision or something completely different. So that's what I'm kind of saying is it's, to me it's like sort of a, there's, there's sort of a repetition of what we've seen in the past. And I'm thinking even way back to the populist era of the, the late 1800s, there was, um, there was a lot of people rising up and, and asking for something new. And somehow that just all just got demolished by the system. And so 
Sorry, I can't put this in no, a real okay. direct question. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens to the momentum that built around the Occupy movement. I think certainly many people that study social movements say that there is a real cyclical nature of a lot of movements and it's related to booms and busts and the political climate and uh, who's the political leader of that country and so the strategic leadership of that movement. Um, What's interesting to me, especially in the Teach for America case, is the tremendous interest in this program among young people. I think that they have articulated a vision that really resonates with a certain kind of young person. Last year alone, 48,000 young people applying to be first year public school teachers in the Mississippi Delta and Los Angeles. These are not, for the most part, glamorous places that they're um, Phoenix sending people to. I heard it's lovely, but um, so I, I think you know. I think the the sort of boom and bust cycle of these sort of mass protests is one thing, and many people are interested in this. And I've read a little bit about it, and I think there are some really persuasive arguments that are made about how it sort of waxes and wanes. But I think there's something about venture activism that is, uh, I mean, Teach for America as an organization and all of its sort of copycat organizations have really experienced meteoric growth over the past 23 years. And so I think they're doing something that is really resonating with a certain kind of person in a certain way. Maybe it's not that controversial, but I think it's worthy of attention for the ways in which it's different than other sorts of movements for social change. So. This question might be a little bit more pertinent for the Teach for America side, but do you know if Teach for America does any sort of tracking on their, on the individuals who completed the program in terms of living out the second half of their mission statement mm -hmm. of producing an individual who, after two years of teaching and education, then go, goes on to the next step of their career and also incorporates some somehow into their life this this sense of um, importance to education mm -hmm. and, and activism and, mm -hmm. and, and getting other people to believe in the importance of education. Yeah, it's a good question. I think both of these organizations are, um, you know, I have a chapter that I'm writing called Beyond Good Intentions. Both of them are really not interested in sort of feel good, uh, I made a kid feel happier in school, that's my measure of success. But both of them are actually extraordinarily numbers focused and are really interested in accountability and tracking the impact that their people have as they go to work as teachers and union organizers in a way that is very different than some other social movements have historically been. So Teach for America, they're very numbers driven and they're very sophisticated about collecting data on their participants. And I will also say that they're incredibly creative <laughs> about how they interpret that data. So almost every person that I met affiliated with the organization said, well, it's really cool because you know, 67% uh, of Teach for America core members stay, for, stay in education for a third year. Now they define education as being in the classroom, working for a public school, being in law school, going back to grad school. So very broad, def so they have a lot of numbers, but what those, num and it was fascinating to me how, you know, I interviewed at 80 people, you know, or 60 people affiliated with Teach for America, and they're all like 67%. I mean, it's like a pretty fantastically disciplined machine over there. I mean, it's really quite impressive of an organization. So um, they do a lot of tracking of their alums, but if they were to say X percentage of our core members, that's what they call their people, are living out the second part of the mission, they're involved in public education, their net for that kind of statement would be huge, what they would consider. So here's an example. I interviewed a woman that worked in their New York headquarters that was involved in selection, and we had this long interview, and I said, okay, so say you have someone that's at the end of their second year and they come to you for advice. She, she was a, sorry, she was a support member for people, not a selection person. Would you encourage them to stay in education or not? She said, oh, whatever they wanna do, we would never encourage them to do either thing. But you know, I get these job uh, postings for you know, investment firms and these other things, and I send them out to all the people because they would definitely be interested in them. And she said, one of the people that I worked with is really involved in the second part of the mission. You know, He's an investment banker, 
and he's getting his coworkers to invest in this um, uh, this sort of social entrepreneur fund to create a, a private charter school in the school system. <laughs> And I saw it's so interesting that, you know, so that you would consider that person like living out this mission of education reform and inequality as an investment banker raising money with their friends to form a private charter school. Oh yeah, they're definitely involved. So I think Teach for America, you could find lots of data and then how you interpret the data and what you would be convinced by as evidence of that second part of the mission might be more narrow or just different than how the organization would. But they are masters at collecting and crunching the numbers. And I don't mean to say that I think they're misleading people, but they uh, have a particular way of defining things and they're very good at putting the message out so that everyone sort of repeats it over and over. Uh, but to me, the thing saying, you know, 67% of our core members stay for a third year and you're including people in law school. No offense to law school, but I don't really think that's, you know, part of the mission. So um, it, it is a point of a lot of criticism of the organization and especially among people that think the solution to the crisis in public education is to have competent, hardworking, properly credentialed, long-term career teachers in the school. Many people that take that perspective are very critical of Teach for America and would say that second part of the mission is way too mushy and squishy to ever really have an impact. Teach for America believes it's the primary goal of their organization, but yeah. Maybe this might be the last question. Okay. How about that? So I'm having a really emotional response to this. <laughs> I have to say, is it really activism if it's not creating change? If it's creating, or if it's not creating the type of social change that its mission implies? Well, I, I think it's a good question. I sometimes ask that question, especially about Teach for America. What, the reason I put it in the realm of activism or social justice is because many of the young people that are involved in both of these organizations do consider it. Their worldview is one in which they consider it to be social change or activism. And the other reason that I do is because both of these organizations really dip deep into the language of previous social movements. That if you ever see a poster for Teach for America, it says, this is the civil rights movement of our generation. <laughs> And many people that look at these organizations from a more historical perspective or maybe a more critical perspective or maybe a more politically radical perspective would say it's not. It has nothing to do with those former organizations. So the question that I'm interested in is if this is the future of activism, which it may or may not be, what does that mean for the future of sort of social change or social movements in the US? Some people would say it's really great. And some people would say, it's really sad. And I'm not gonna, I, I go back and forth on it all the time, I'm not gonna tell you what to think, but I know people on both sides that would be very energized and enthusiastic about it, and also very sad if this is the future of activism, so. Okay, I think that's about it. If you have more questions, come on down and ask Professor okay, Rooks. Thank Thanks, you. Daisy.